what is the stove? Where are you? What do you do? Um, absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, the stove is a network membership organization, but it's also a building on the Dumfries High Street. Um, it's sort of got quite bigger than it used to be. It started as a collective of artists and now it's an organization that uses art practice in community-led decision-making to sort of come up with new things about its place. So, and I'm Catherine Wheeler. I've been freelance for a very long time as a visual and community focused artist, but just recently we've sort of restructured our management and our sort of working system at the stove. So I now lead for partnerships and project development. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to share because I know you sent us a lovely PowerPoint to go through. So I'll <laughs> begin sharing that and do just let me know when you want to um, change slides. Brilliant. Well, the first one's just a holder slide, so you can probably go straight to the second one. <clears throat> so I put this together just to tell briefly the, the story of the stove, if you like, but I sort of feel like I, I should have left space to talk a wee bit more about what Dumfries and Galloway in general, but we'll see how we go. So we talk about the stove as a civic and community space that's founded by artists. Um, like I said, it sits on the high street of Dumfries in southwest Scotland, Dumfries and Galloway. We're a values-based organisation that uses creativity as a tool to actively involve our local community in shaping um, what happens in the town. But recently we've been focusing a lot more as well on what our place is as part of a regional organisation. How can we share our learning and expertise? Um, how can we work with others in community focused practice? Um, we have a strong commitment to locally led solutions, place-based practice, growing and supporting the creative work in D&G and really advocating for the role that creativity can have in um, grassroots action and community-led decision-making. If you could change slide, please. So what's the role of arts practice in this work? That's something that I often sort of talk to people about and how can that be effective? How can that affect change as part of our communities and what principles, values guide our work? Next slide, please. Oh, I didn't know I'd made that fade in. So I think to start our story, it's best to think about these values because that's what we come back to. Everything that we do is affected by the people or the place that we're working with. But what's more constant is the values and our approach. We see our values as artists, as using creative, and we're not all artists. In fact, many of us aren't. But so myself as an artist uh, or artist that we work with, as using creative practice, um, to play with um, ideas as part of our community. So it's not really about our individual creative practice. It's about how that responds to a community, though we do create residencies that maybe are part of that. But it's, it's something different, really, the work that we do. It's about socially engaged um, practice that, that's, that's embedded in community, if you like. Um, so we think about how can we share that with others? How can, you know, how can we as artists share the skills we have? How can we be a relevant resource to our community? How can we be useful? How can we evolve conversations together? So this most importantly is a conversation that is independent. It takes risks. It's um, not necessarily connected to an agenda. Um, we do work with larger institutions and local authorities, but we're independent from that. And it's informed by our community and our membership as much as possible so that we can be relevant and have a real impact for our place. So everything we do sort of forms part of this conversation. I wanted to show these signs here. We often change the signboard of the stove to sort of um, prompt and interrogate that conversation. And actually one of the projects that's grown out of um, a mid steeple quarter project, which I'll talk about very briefly, is a women's sign painting um, group, which is just amazing. And it's led by one of the stove artists, Katie Anderson, who's just there up in the left. So back to our values, I just wanted to quickly say our values are risk taking, collaboration, acknowledging emotions, empowerment, positive disruption, disruptive change, innovation and inclusion. 
Um, next slide, please. To put our place in context, um, Dumfries is the biggest town in Dumfries and Galloway, Southwest Scotland. Um, for those who don't know, it's around a population of 30,000. Um, we have an aging population, lower than average employment levels, and we lose a lot of our young people to the cultural, larger cultural centers like Glasgow and Carlisle. Next slide, please. Our town center is in the top 10% of Scotland's multiple index of deprivation, which is not an uncommon story. Um, and basically the stove started as a response to this. It started thinking of, like I said, a collective of artists coming together and saying, what's the purpose of a rural market town in the 21st century? Next slide, please. So to answer this question, the stove set out um, and it felt that it really needed a building in the first instance so that it was part of the high street community or lack of resident community actually in our case. So that arrow there points to where the stove sits on the high street in Dumfries and that red area if you could just clock that for your memory that's the mid steeple quarter project which is a community benefit society in its own right looking at ownership of the high street well does own now five buildings in the high street and I'm just going to reference that again later. Um, next slide, slide, please. So in order to answer this question, what's the purpose of a market town and rural market town 21st century, the stove sort of came up with a very simple regeneration strategy, if you like. If we grow people, grow events and activity, grow collaborative partnerships around projects, then um, we can hopefully help creatively problem solve that, that challenge. Next slide, please. So we do this through what we call a conversational practice. We build spaces for conversation, places to imagine things differently, to gather differently and to participate differently. So these are two early stove projects on the left there as part of a local festival, Good Neighbours. We ask people to reimagine their town centre through um, taking part in writing a town charter. And on the right, a very simple social media project asking people what what building or what would their home or office say if it could speak? Next slide, please. We run a program of regular activity from a three-story building in the high street, like I said, alongside um, larger responsive, well, more immediate responsive or larger strategic projects. Our regular program is really there to build relationships and trust and allows us to respond to locally relevant issues as part of our community. The stove has very much become a place for discussion. There's a cafe on the town floor, which, uh, sorry, the ground floor, which is the heart of this. Next slide, please. It's a place from which to explore and test uses of public space. This is an outdoor cinema with a pizza oven. Next slide, please. A place for local groups to come together and talk about our needs. This is the local um, deaf um, group that took over our cafe to run a deaf cafe. Next slide, please. And a place for larger partnership events that celebrate the identity of our town. So this is Nithraid, an annual river um, race event. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> and the stove sort of holds all sorts of meetings and conversations. This was one around transport. People attended who represented different parts of the transport debate and came up with a sort of transport policy for Dumfries. Next slide, please. And this is Square Go, it was a large scale project that we drew the river and the high street, sketched out the town square with models of buildings and asked people what they felt their town needed. And then they drew that on, on the street. Next slide, please. So this is the stove practice that, that has grown, that, that we talk about as growing projects and hopefully starting new things, events and festivals, new social enterprises that the stove doesn't hold on to ownership of, but let's, but, but hopefully they grow out of this practice. So this is Dumfries Music um, Conference, which started from this practice and is now a kick in its own right. Next slide, please. Deluxe Light Festival is an annual light event. Next slide, please. 
and Mid-Steeple Quarter, which is probably the most notable and ambitious of these. So it was born from this approach that the stove and a stove project, but it's now launched as a community benefit society in its own right in 2017, quite a while ago, and it's grown into a completely much larger um, thing. And it's a, now a multi-partner, multi-million pound development project that, like I said, owns five buildings on the high street and is looking at affordable housing and various um, mid-term and long-term use, um, short-term as well, spaces and how that can help the regeneration of the town centre. So that's sort of, I'm not going to talk anymore because I'm running out of um, time, but um, that sort of shapes the, the practice of, of the stove. Um, and now that the mid steeple quarter is set up, our conversation is more about what's our new purpose. You know, what, what, what's the purpose of artists on the high street? And we're really looking at that about for our place, but also for um, ourselves across the region. And please do, I think we can share the slides, but we're leading a project at the moment, which is part of the National Culture Collective in Scotland. Um, oh, I don't know how to stop my, um, my timer which is part of the National Culture Collective in Scotland, which is looking at supporting artists and communities. And our project is called What We Do Now, and it's working in five places across the region in a networked way and hopefully a devolved way. So, it, so the stove is holding a joined up story, but then the place hubs in each place are leading um, their own story. They're employing two artists for a year. And we have a regional steering group to help join the learning of that project up, of which um, Upland has been on and Amy's been very generous with her time. So, so yeah, but hopefully we uh, share the slides, uh, slideshow as well, because there was a few things I didn't get to. Thank you. Catherine, that was splendid. And so much in common with Cumbria, your description of the, the environment up there, you know, low income, aging population, urban drain, that's very familiar to all of us here. Uh, it'd be really interesting to go straight on to the presentation of Auckland and then we could all yeah. put our questions to the three of you because you've already alluded to the fact that you, you do work together as organizations so uh joanna and amy if you if you can tell us a little about your work at upland that would be great hi um yes yeah, thanks for inviting us i'm just putting about i'm gonna just put my timer on um because um yeah i'm amy marlette i'm the creative director at, at upland and i'm joined today by my colleague joanna mccauley who's assistant director so yeah, pleased to be here and um, we're just going to um, split our presentation. So I'm just going to talk for five minutes and then Joanna's going to talk for five minutes um, about Spring Fling Open Studios. So I'll just get going. Um, the timer's on. So basically, um, Upland is a visual art and craft development organisation for Dumfries and Galloway. So we don't have a public facing venue. We have an office space um, in Dumfries at Gracefield Arts Centre. And thank you, Kat, for um, your map and putting all that <laughs> in place because I wasn't as organised to do that. But um, so, yes, yeah, so we're in Dumfries as well, the same as the stove. But um, yeah, we just have an office. So we were based there, but we work region wide. So we um, we really have to kind of we take our projects out throughout the region and find venues to partner with um, to deliver projects in different places and Upland evolved from Spring Fling uh, CIC in 2015 so we now have a year-round programme but Spring Fling Open Studios remains as our flagship event and as I say Joanna's going to come on to talk about that shortly. We are also a membership organisation and we work to create like a range of opportunities and projects that connect um, our artists and makers with audiences, communities, and of course, with each other, as you'll understand, really important in a big um, rural spread out area. And we support and promote the region's visual artists and makers to develop and showcase their work and um, inspire and educate a wide range of audiences to also participate in and be supportive of visual arts and crafts. Uh, next slide, please, Amy. So just, um, as a kind of headings, I'm just going to skip through. I'm going to skip through some of our, our projects so that you can kind of get a feel for the things that we actually deliver. So we have already mentioned Spring Fling, 
um, emerge, which we'll come back to, opportunities for emerging artists and established artists, um, residencies and outreach, creative and professional development exhibitions, particular projects um, for young people such as modern makers and we also take artists and makers into schools. Unfortunately, we've not really been able to do that um, so much recently, obviously. Um, Amy, can you just flick to the next slide? Um, I actually just flicked to the next one. I'm just flicking past Spring Fling because Joanna's going to come on to that. So how do we connect our um, membership of artists and makers to these different audiences? Um, so one of the ways we do that is through programmes like Modern Makers. So this, this project allows a small group of young people to learn craft skills directly from experienced makers. And it also creates um, paid opportunities for the makers. So we advertise those um, those, those jobs to lead the project so that the makers can, you know, set that aside of time to focus on um, sharing the skills with the young people. Uh, as well as sharing skills, the young people also get uh, an insight into how a creative business runs. And it goes over a period of about six months. And when I say young people for modern makers, it's usually between kind of 16 up to 30. Uh, next slide, please, Amy. And we have a different focus on the craft each year. So there's been glass, printmaking, textiles, uh, woodworking, design. So it's just led by whoever that maker is that year and, and given the, the young people a, a very unique experience each time. Uh, next slide, please, Amy. And I, again, we have another program um, for emerging artists and makers called Emerge, which is a program of mentoring and a bursary for emerging artists with a connection to Dumfries and Galloway. So that runs over a kind of six to nine month period. They have a bursary of a thousand pounds and they get to take part in Spring Fling Open Studios. Uh, and we're actually in the process that had, has, has usually been in that same kind of young person bracket, but we're very aware that obviously you can come to a creative career at any age. So we're, we've actually opened that, that right up um, and this year um, the applications are open and we have one, one award for a, a young artist and one doesn't have um, an age category at all. And that's very much the direction of, of, of travel to try and open up the, the projects as, as much as, as possible um, and create as many different routes into creative practice as possible. Sorry, I had timed this for to be 10 minutes, not realising it had only to be five minutes. So Amy, just go to the next slide and I'll just skip through very quickly. Um, so um, we, we also deliver professional and creative development for established artists as well as um, emerging practitioners. And this is just an example of some of the things that we've been focusing on recently that have proved successful um, with our membership. So peer support groups and mentoring, some small bursaries, exhibition opportunities, workshops and talks, um, advice sessions, and we're building up online resources as well. Uh, next slide, Amy. Um, so just very, very quickly before I pass on to, to Joanna, um, as I said, because we don't have a venue it is really important for us to be um, out delivering projects in different areas with different different people and commissioning artists to make work that is relevant to, to Dumfries and Galloway. So in 2017-2018, we started to pilot projects for artists to undertake commissions or residencies um, to explore different, different themes in different places with different, different communities. Um, so, for example, this project uh, allowed artists to explore climate change in relation to the landscape of Dumfries and Galloway. We often take a collaborative approach with projects, so working with artists from the region as well as artists from out with and kind of bringing those together. So for this project, you know, they worked in schools, they worked with different community groups. And you may if you just flip to the next slide and then the next slide. And there was an outcome with this one, um, a gallery um, outcome at, at Gracefield, um, but the work created had been, um, had, had involved the school pupils as well. So they had created designs which were then cast into these aluminium um, 
uh, pieces that you can see on the floor there. Uh, so I think I'm going to have to just hand over to Joanna. Like I say, I'm sorry, I kind of thought I had 10 minutes. <laughs> I've squeezed it into five. So Amy, if you just flick through. We the really images. appreciate your pace here, Amy. Thank sorry, you. <laughs> it's too fast. Mm. Just start to skip over all that stuff um, and pass over to Joanna. Okay. Um... I'll try and shorten mine down a little bit as well. So um, as Amy said, um, Upland kind of evolved out of Spring Fling. Spring Fling um, was established in 2003. Um, it was founded by the Visual Arts Development Officer at the Council, um, Dumfries and Gallery Council, and a committee of artists and makers. Um, and, and then it kind of, as it evolved um, in 2009, um, it, it actually became independent of the local authority and form and sprinkling open studios was uh, CIC was formed um, with Natalie Vardy, a jeweler, becoming the first chair. Um, and each year it's developed. Um, the first event saw 72 um, studios open their doors. They had about 4,000 visitors and took about £29,000 um, worth of sales in their studios. Um, and then more recently, um, in 2019, which is our last normal year, <laughs> um, the event saw 93 studios opening their doors, over 36,000 visitors to the event and over 200,000 pounds spent in the studio. So it's developed year in, year out. Um, but the event at its core, um, it is 80 to 100 uh, professional artists and makers throwing open their doors. You all kind of know what open studios format is, but um, this offers um, visitors a chance to get behind the scenes of artistic practice, to experience um, the artists and makers demonstrating and explaining their processes um, and inspirations. And obviously people have the chance to buy directly from the artists. Um, every studio is unique and every artist is unique. And some are in kind of, um, back rooms where they make their jewellery in the utility rooms, some are in big barns, some are in um, more of a gallery um, kind of setting. Uh, we have obviously the other schemes which involve people from out with the region, so um, we find help find studios for the people from out with the region. Um, so every studio and, and every experience is different. Um, the region is very broad, um, so we have regularly have people taking part from Port William and Wigtown, in the west, um, and we right through kind of Kirkcubri, Castle Douglas, uh, Dumfries, uh, further north in Sanker and Thornhill, and also um, further east in Lockerbie, Langham, uh, and surrounding areas. Um, and we tend to split the region up into routes to to group the studios, um, and just to make it a little bit easier for the visitors travelling around the area if they want to pick a route and, and do a route on one day, um, and as well as kind of the broad um, spread of the participants, it's a broad spread of disciplines. Um, so we have lots of like lots of different disciplines. Obviously, there's like a lot of textiles, jewellery, painting, printmaking, um, glass. There's furniture, wood, willow, ceramics, photography, and you name it. So there's a good there's a there's a great range. It's um it's a professional event. So every year people apply uh, to take part. Um, and are selected by a, an external panel. Um, once selected, it is up to the participants to present their studio to, to make sure it's ready um, for the visitors. Upland is all the promotion, advertising and signage, and um, we produce a, a high quality brochure. I've got one here. It's under a pile of stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll whiz past that. <laughs> um, um, but there's a lot of work that goes into to making the events um, Kind of unfeaturing the core, which is the artists and makers, um, and these the, these images are kind of just examples of some of the studios. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So I'll I'll go past this. This I was going to talk here about our additional projects. So, but these are just examples of the kind of things that supplement the core of the event. So, over the years we've done um, exhibitions, we've done public art. Um, we've done um, we've kind of small scale commissions, pop up shops. So we've got here, we've got top left, we've got a mural that was in Berlin, um, which was part of our sprinkling rural mural. Um, top right, we've got a pop up shop at Gatehouse of Fleet that was part of this year's event. 
Um, bottom right, we've got Edge, which was um, a commission which created like a ghost tideline um, and people could interact with all the objects. And then bottom left, we've got an exhibition where we partnered with um, New Brewery Arts in Sirencester. So these are all kind of additional to the, the core event that are aimed at um, giving the artists further opportunities, the visitors, um, other ways to engage and also to kind of build up further media attention that ultimately draws people to the studios for the event. Um, and we'll go to the next one, please. This too, I'll kind of, I'll skip past, but this just kind of shows the last two years. This was spring fling as affected by COVID. Um, the, in 2020, um, obviously everything kind of kicked off in March and April um, and spring flings in, at the end of May each year. So uh, kind of 90% of the event had been planned and money had spent on <laughs> essentially. Um, so, and was committed to. So um, we took the decision to um, reschedule the event to later in the October in the hope that things might have eased. Um, so and, and created um, SF at home, which was just some short term kind of reactive activity that um, filled a gap for the artists and makers, because as I've kind of said at the beginning, the event actually generates a lot of money in the studios for the for the participants. So it's a big gap in, in their year. Um, and then this year we had more of a hybrid event um, and this was kind of a start, this was uh, developed throughout lockdown so we were, we were um, working on this throughout the lockdown period um, and we were able to do some physical elements that um, were primarily outside with um, an outdoor commission and some outdoor workshops but we also were able to have two pop-up shops um, and we'll just go on to the next one please. So um, now we're kind of looking ahead till next to next year um, and we're really hoping for a return to the open studios. I think everybody is a bit fed up um, and everybody's done really well with online, um, but there's a, a kind of real drive to get back to physically meeting people and selling work and viewing work. Um, so next year, we'll also be celebrating our 20th event. Um, so we're looking forward to celebrating that mind, milestone, but we're obviously mindful that COVID has not disappeared. Um, so it's still very prominent in our plans. Um, the focus will be on opening the studios and celebrating the core event, uh, which is the artists and makers. Um, next year, the event will be four days instead of three. Uh, it's normally the last three, like the late May bank holiday in, in May, uh, but next year it's moved back a week uh, to coincide with the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. So the dates are the 2nd to the 5th of June next year. Uh, we'll also have two exhibitions, one milestone showcase at Gracefield Art Centre in Dumfries, which will celebrate the event over the years. And we've got a second one at the Biscuit Factory in Newcastle, uh, which is open to all Upland members that have taken part in the event before. Um, as well as the exhibition, we've got three commissions uh, focusing on film, design and visual art. We're relaunching the app, which kind of was meant to launch in 2020, but obviously didn't quite come off so we're relaunching the app which will help people travel around the region and plan their routes um, and we also have our program of bus tours uh, we'll be keeping our virtual studios which we developed over the, the last kind of couple of years through the pandemic and we'll also be returning to our kind of high levels of quality print uh, materials so the applications are open now um, and they close uh, next month the 24th of October we have um, the event is obviously for Dumfries and Galloway artists, but as we said, there's other ways for people from out with the region to take part. We've got the neighbour scheme, which is open to our neighbouring regions, which includes Cumbria. Uh, this is about six to eight spaces. Um, and as I said, we can help people find venues if, if they don't have something in mind. Um, we also have a spring back scheme, which is open to artists and makers who have a strong connection to either uh, the event, to Upland or to the region. We have our new graduate scheme, which is open to any artists and makers um, based living and working in Scotland who are kind of embarking on, a, on their, their chosen career path or in their creative practice, I should say. Um, and we also have a bursary, which does actually reduce the fee. Um, so um, I realise that's a lot of information crammed, <laughs> crammed into a short space of time. But all like as I say, applications are open now. They're open on the Upland website. Um, I've put the link there for... 
um, the event page, the event uh, website as well. Um, and we'll just finish up on the last slide, if that's okay. So this was just to highlight some like our current opportunities that we have at the moment. Um, this is of this is kind of Uplands um, prod like wide projects, not just spring fling. Um, and we've got these commissions upcoming. So all this will kind of go out on the website, but there's there's opportunities here for artists and makers to get involved, but also for creative businesses in general. So I'll leave it there. Joanna, thank you so much. Joanna, Amy, Catherine, thank you so much for being so speedy. Yes, huge round of applause, however muted it is. Um, <laughs> we know what extraordinary range of work you're doing and how um, the depth of it and there's so much so many resonances with what happens here in Cumbria and um, particularly that link to your neighbours scheme uh, that would be great Joanna if you could pop that in the chat or, or a link to the website so people can follow up on that invitation to practitioners here as well. Um, we had a, we had a very a very um, straightforward question for you Catherine why the stove? Yeah I saw that one <laughs> wasn't there when it was named to be honest so I'm not sure but the mid steeple quarter project at one point their building was called the oven and we were getting a bit carried away with our you know um one of our only founding members who's left Matt is called Mr ba is Matt Baker so I was, <laughs> you know what we play with words all the time and we use like names I suppose we thought we were thinking of the kitchen stove you know the sort of coming round coming together what's an yeah. equalizer how do you sort of you know um what sort of things bring people together across classes across backgrounds and food is is very much a constant it's why we've got the cafe in 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 the bottom and the cafe is not just a part of what we do it's actually becoming more and more the heart of what we do in Dumfries yes. High Street um we do other things but in terms of our creative regular program and our work as part of our community in Dumfries it's it's we're thinking of it as a community venue and and the cafe is, is that so the stove but it took us a long time to put the stove on the building um and for a while people like you, you have to put the stove on the building you can't just keep changing your uh, your yeah. sign <laughs> cocn has just been through a similar process of what, what's a what's a good name it's it's um the mm. signposting of it is so interesting um amy you you you, you mentioned you just said in passing amy Mm -hmm. uh, you said out west. Um, it just made me curious about across your huge county, much like here in Cumbria, is there a big disparity about resources available? And, and um, you, I, I think I heard you say out west, which resonates here massively because the west coast here is um, much less well served, although many people yeah. on this meeting are doing a lot about that. Um, can you say a little bit, little bit about Yeah, I would say, you know, like the spread of Dumfries and Galloway, obviously that is a challenge and for us to work region wide and to try and make sure that we spread activity and, and opportunity, um, you know, we're constantly trying to find ways and, and make sure that, that we can do that. Travel is a big issue, obviously, like what we talked about earlier about um, the, the online Thing, but that's you know that's that that's good for certain things but you can't do it all like that so so yeah actually we are we are looking towards the ways to try and um deliver some new new projects um out in that direction and we've kind of started that by um well through discussions with with artists and makers in that in that particular area to try and understand better what, what the needs and the, the wants are but it's just yeah that will just take time Do you know I didn't I didn't really go into it but those projects that I kind of skipped through at the end where we're taking projects into rural areas um you know it's it's the time it takes to build the kind of partnerships to make sure whatever you're doing there is meaningful that it's relevant to the place I'm sure this can resonate with Kat as well you know um not just kind of parachuting in and doing something and then leaving again you know what is needed what is wanted and you know what's that legacy going to be um we can't do everything so it's very much about kind of working together with our memberships but also with um, other partners so there's quite a yeah there's there's a, a combination of things I think that, ha that have to happen to kind of lead to that but we're definitely um working on it and I know that the stove the stove are, are, have got work out that way as well so I don't know if Kat wants to talk about um the residency project that they've got out in the waste 
How does that work for you, Catherine? Yeah, I mean, I love the chat. How long have we got? <laughs> um, basically, the stove felt like it had to grow its practice in its place. And then it was part of regional, you know, but we've always felt that we wanted to be part of policy conversations, regional strategic conversations. <clears throat> and we've grown a network of partnerships. I think the regional organizations like Upland Wigtown Book Festival, DG Arts Festival, we've all been quite good at talking to each other for quite a long time. But to answer simply, there's a huge disparity. And like Amy said, we're working within an infrastructure that is simply not there. You know, so in terms of disparities in funding, in terms of how young people can get from one place to the other, when they moved the, the ferry terminal in Stranra, you know, to drive from Stranra to Langham, um, you know, and, and, and you get people from Central Belt or companies that, or organizations that are like, great, you know, you work in Dumfries and Galloway. We've got a project in Stranra. Well, it will be quicker for my partner, who this is a, a direct personal example, to drive to Glasgow takes him an hour from where we live. You know, it takes two to go to Stranra. You know, if they want to go from it all, but there's so much happening in Stranra, so much happening. And just like Dumfries High Street and our other communities that have social and economical challenges, people are sick of going, oh, you know, it doesn't have anything. Actually, Stranra Development Trust, Stranra Oyster Festival, the World Skiff Championships. So there's this constant tension of how do we work together? How do we really work in a way that, that amplifies and works with what's there, but also in a joined up way so that we have a powerful voice to challenge what is needed in Dumfries and Galloway. And now we're thinking more south of Scotland. And if we get shortlisted for the city of culture, and we've already talked about the borderlands, then you know what's the joined up bits? Because there's lots of similar threads that we have more power if we advocate for together. So yeah, we're working in Stranra for the What We Do Now Culture Collective Project, um, but we're working through a hub. So we're working through the Millennium Center and they're using their network. So we're employing the artists and bringing our experience of um, working with artists in a process-led process way of co-creating work with communities, which is quite a difficult and challenging way because you have no idea what project's going to be. But Stranra Millennium Center have the project budget. They have, you know, they're like um, the, the hub organization. So it's an experiment. Ask us in uh, next year. <laughs> okay, so familiar, north, south of this county, might as well be a different country, I think. A lot of people would agree that it's so hard, the transport, and what you're saying about access for young people. Um, oh. we, we have just a couple of minutes left before we, we move on to our gig of the week. So if you do have any questions for uh, Amy, Joanna, or Catherine, please raise your virtual hand. That's the quickest way of seeing who has points to make. Uh, the chat is is a fi on fire with them. Um, all sorts of responses to what you've, you've raised. So, but if you do have any questions you'd like to ask, do, do raise a virtual hand. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask a big one about Creative Scotland. There we go. Okay. I love talking about creative. <laughs> you got Amy, Joanna, Catherine. Um, the Fair Work Review, tell us about that. What was your, this is a, it's a big new, a big new a policy and approach, a piece of work that Creative Scotland are doing for you there. I mean, we like we were saying at the beginning, we could probably wave at you, but funding-wise, policy-wise, it's a completely different system. If we if we tour work to your part of the world, it's 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 touring abroad. <laughs> um, so tell us a little about your relationship with Creative Scotland. I think the diff Amy, do you want to go first? No, you can go first, Cap. <clears throat> okay. I was actually just talking to Jeannie Scott, who's works for who is Cultural Radar, who's who's leading the Fair Work Review with Creative Scotland. But I have to also admit that I haven't like fully, there's so many conversations going on, it's, it's hard to follow which, but my, to talk a bit more about Creative Scotland as our national, our funding body compared to ACE, I sit on the advocacy group for Artworks Alliance, um, which is national. And that is my experience of sort of the English picture in compared to the Northern Irish and the Scottish and the Welsh. And I think, and I just went to, a uh, conference in Leeds um, by Slung Low. And I think my, in my experience, the biggest difference is, is I would say that any organization like ours and Upland, it'd be interesting to see if Amy feels that way, is it's frustrating, we have challenges, 
but we are talking directly to Creative Scotland. We're not only just talking directly to Creative Scotland, we're talking to people in Scottish government. You know, we are talking to people who are writing economic strategy. We are talking to the people who, you know, so the Culture Collective Fund came out of um, an advi advisory group, the National Partnership for Culture, that the stove was on. And we took our Embers work, which I put a link to about this sort of joined up, how do you support creative freelancers in communities? And that was part of shaping that fund which went to Scottish government, which went to Creative Scotland. Now, not everybody's in, involved, but, but I think the access is just phenomenal. You know, our mm -hmm. population, uh, and, and I think we are further ahead in the valuing of this grassroots way of working. Um, that's not to say it's all working, but I suppose we have a bigger voice. So the fair works policy is part of that. You know, people are part of those conversations. Um, so yeah, I think we could talk about it a lot, but I think- well, that's. Think that's we, really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Amy, I mean, did you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I mean, just like in, in general, like we do have a large part of our funds and come from Creative Scotland on a regular basis, but we, we have to fundraise year upon year. So it's really, really difficult for us to really look ahead, which is incredibly frustrating because it's quite an insecure way to exist, obviously. Um, so, you know, Creative Scotland also has its uh, regularly funded organisations, which are like three, three years at a time, but that hasn't really been available for us to apply to because of everything that's happened with COVID. They've, you know, they've ruled on all the existing organisations, so we've not been able to, to go for that. So I suppose that's just to explain the kind of um, the way that we are funded through them. You know, not that I'm complaining, the, the we actually we, it sort of touched on there, you know, we have a very sort of good and direct relationship with Creative Scotland. It feels supportive, you know, a lot of good discussion and, 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 and yeah, the, the, the support that they've given us over the past five years, you know, has, has been great. But they have had this big review of how they're, how they're structuring their, their funding. And my understanding of it is that they can see that actually those two kind of strands that year upon year and then that regular funding doesn't really fit everybody you know it's just not, you know organizations are all different kind of shapes and sizes so it seems like they are going to be transitioning to a kind of a, a, a framework that that's 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 more um, I suppose that they, they will maybe make it more bespoke and actually work with organisations to see what works for them rather than you have to fit into one or the other. And I think for me, I feel that's, that's, that's very welcome. I think it will take a while to make that transition, but uh, that dialogue is open. You know, they've, they're, they're updating us on, on, on what that is going to look like. And I think that's a positive, a positive yeah. move. Well, um... Thank you so much. It looks like from the chat, you're going to get a lot of people <laughs> migrating to take advantage of that, uh, that wonderful relationship with Creative Scotland. Thank you so much to all three of you for that and a very rich discussion there. Um, I'm sure you're going to get another virtual round of applause. Um, there it is, uh, muted as it is. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, and I hope that the conversations continue. You did allude to the, um, the Borderlands um, uh, bid that will be coming in i'm sure we'll be discussing that more in the future thank you um right we'll, we'll move on now to al critchlow um described as um an impressively hardy artist in the book Gosh. i'm reading at the moment. <laughs> yeah and lingard calls you an impressively hardy artist Al. do you want to tell us about the um the around the island um, studios please yeah um so first up thank you so much for asking me to to speak about this for 10 minutes and it's just brilliant to hear about what's going on on the other side of the Solway um so bonus on Solway is where the around the island art trail takes place um it's on this coming weekend and next weekend as well um and so from my window here I'm looking out across to Dumfries and Galloway um and I look across to Scotland daily and I feel very connected to Scotland, as do most people here. This is a very forgotten part of Cumbria, a very rural part of Cumbria. Um, and it's fair to say our little art trail has got a real buzz about it. So it, it might be very small, like there's only eight artists um, involved. Um, 
but it is kind of unique. And I'm going to just talk you briefly around what makes it unique and why you need to get yourself in a car or a, a bus if you're really lucky um, over to Bonas and Solway. So we lie about 30 miles from Carlisle to the west. Um, so you need to follow the coast road out from Carlisle to Brough by Sands. When you get there, you come to a cattle grid. And as you rumble across the cattle grid, you'll find you're on this very, very straight road and that you are following the route of Hadrian's Wall. And then you'll probably, you'll probably find yourself in, a, in amongst a herd of cows and there'll be random sheep and the sky kind of brightens and everything opens out and you find yourself looking across to Scotland and it is like um, a different landscape. So you've entered the salt marsh at that point. And you'll see signs on the road, which is slightly alarming if you're not used to it, which tell you the depth of water um, that may or may not occur on the road. Um, so just to put your mind at ease, uh, the island is called the island because on high spring tides or in really big weather, the roads do get cut off by the tide. So locally, this little area is known as the island. So our little art trail is about a 10 mile radius. So you could do it in a day. Um, and I'll just briefly take you through who's exhibiting what you might expect to see. So could I have the next slide, Amy? Please. Oh, sorry, it's just decided to... <laughs> That's okay, don't worry. <laughs> just so, bear with me, I'll try again. The, the thing about it is, I suppose, our little environment, the Fliss was mentioning in the chat, the question of, um, you know, being rural and how that affects arts practice. And I would say, in our case, our our rurality is huge. I mean, we're, we're cut off even from the rest of Cumbria, really. I have a friend who affectionately calls this the back of beyond um, in the nicest way. And it is, you know, it's it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. It's an absolute paradise for bird life. And really it's all about the tides and the estuary. So I suppose you could say all the artists here have very diverse practices. We're all enthusiastic about different ideas, different things. We're all exploring different things, but that kind of, that light and that rhythm of the tide is there present with all of us. So really the estuary binds it all together. If you move us on, Amy, I don't want to waffle on too much. So move us on and I'll talk about everyone. So each studio is quite unique. Um, you've got on the left there, that's the old chapel at Anthorn, which is just amazing. So. To put that in context, it it's, looks out onto the water. So as you drive around the island, you'll, if you follow our route, you'll come into Bonas from Carlisle direction, and you'll follow the road around the salt marsh past the RSPB reserve. Then you go through this amazing um, area with the masts um, and the old you know, wartime gun emplacements, which is an extraordinary thing. All the time you're sort of got the estuary by your side, and then you turn the corner and suddenly, rather than looking at Cripple mm -hmm. and Scotland, you turn the corner and you're suddenly looking at the Lake District Hills. So you've got this wonderful sort of shift in view and the chapel at Anthorn is looking across to the hills. And then the building on the right there is my studio, which was built um, three years ago. So, you know, a really modern uh, take on a studio. So would you move us on, Amy? I'll briefly introduce you to each person you can expect to meet. So Rowena Beatty is a sculptor based in Bonas. Um, so she makes, uh, she works with stone and it's all hand carved, um, hand carved stone. I mean, she's extraordinary. This, this piece on the left is called Seabird and it's made from um, Lavu limestone. So she, I asked her about, you know, the stone and she said, oh, it's from this quarry near Poitiers in France. Honestly, she's fascinating. If you get her talking about stone, absolutely, she can just tell you all about the qualities of stone. She goes usually to select her stone from different quarries. Um, equally, get her on the subject of tools. Oh my goodness, you could be there for hours. But so interesting, you know, she, and she was laying them all out. I went to see her yesterday and she said, well, these are called rifflers. And I'm like, oh, rifflers, who knew? And there's all these great, really specific tools for a particular job. Um, anyway, go and see her and she can explain to you and will happily explain to you all about her processes and her ideas, which are very much bound up in landscape. Um, absolutely serene. Okay, the next, the next slide, please. So Roger is, Roger Golding is just a little further along the road from Rowena. Um, he came here about the same time as me, just about three years ago from London. He's a painter and printmaker. 
with a very um, meticulous process, I think you would say. So he tends to use photographs as a starting point and uh, he's very interested in grids and, and this kind of um, digital manipulation and a very precise process of kind of manipulating and shifting around images. Um, really fascinating to talk to Roger. Uh, and you can see on the left there, the sunny flag, that's the system we use for uh, way marking. So to help, to help uh, visitors find the studios. And when you get here, we'll just give you a leaflet which has a wee map, so you'll be all good. Uh, it's such a small trail that um, you can't honestly get lost. <laughs> There's only really one road, so you know, happy days. Um, can we have the next one, Amy, please? So Johnny Leach, um, he's at Greenspot, which is a little hamlet on the way back on the main road back to Carlisle. Um, so on the left there, you can see um, a really good example of his wood turning skill. So he's, I think you would call him a contemporary wood turner in as much as he uses, he has a, he has an absolutely brilliant eye for shapes and he uses um, local wood. Usually it's um, fallen trees or, you know, wind damaged, uh, storm damaged trees. And he'll show you around how his process works, but it, it's amazing. He'll dry the wood for usually a couple of years. So he's got various sheds with different parts of his process going on. And on the right there, I think you'll agree, the most beautiful wood pile in the world. Um, and that's before, you know, and, and he'll show you everything he gets up to on the lathe, which is uh, mostly bowls and these lovely salt and pepper mills, but also very unique bespoke pieces. You know, he's, he's fascinating to speak to. Okay, next one, please, Amy. Okay, Jan Goody. So um, Jan is our guest artist, which is new for us. We've never had a guest artist before. So she used to live at Port Collar, just along the road from here. And she's now based in Kendall. Um, these two images, I went to see her yesterday uh, and she was explaining to me, these are, um, she calls them shelters. And uh, she uses mostly um, porcelain and wire. And these particular set of work is a reflection really on um, shelters and how actually people are in this fragile state currently around the world where shelters are inadequate. Um, she makes vessels that have holes in that don't really function and shelters that wouldn't really work as shelters. Um, and she, she's making a whole series of work at the moment which will uh, form part of an exhibition. She, she'll be donating part of her proceeds to the um, resettlement of Afghans in Cumbria as well. So she's fascinating. I mean, her practice is extraordinary. She uses quite a lot of wire, which is almost like drawing. Um, she also uses really fragile texture, which is just gorgeous and fascinating. So I would really recommend visiting her. So she's she's got a space at Pear Tree uh, Farm, which is also a cafe in bonus. Could we move on, Amy, please? Oh, this is me. So um, I'm in bonus too. Uh, I'm a painter. I'm, it's fair to say I'm a fairly messy painter. I'm, I'm very much about the process of painting and really fascinated in how that process of painting can inform your thinking and fascinating to hear people talking earlier about using creative process to open up a conversation. Um, I'm fascinated by that. At the moment, I'm experimenting with quite a lot of new ways of working. Um, as part of a sort of research and development project uh, funded by the Arts Council. Um, and I'm really exploring how words might sit within my process as well. So poetry particularly. So I've hung, I've done that thing where I've hung the work I'm really working on at the moment, which is quite unknown and, and pushing in different directions alongside work from a few years ago that was made in Dove Cottage Garden, um, Wordsworth's uh, Garden in Grasmere. Uh, which is quite fascinating for me to look across the years, how the thinking is, is threading across. Okay, could we have the next one, please? So this is Ray Pearson. He's at uh, Newton Arlosh, which is literally across the water from uh, Hillary's beautiful chapel. They can actually wave at each other more or less. Um, anyway, Ray is amazing. I went up there the other day because I don't know him very well. And he's got this enormous setup where he teaches ceramics. So loads of um, wheels and uh, wood firing kilns. Um, absolutely fascinating to talk to him. He, 
uses a lot of local clay, digs a lot of clay, and he makes his own glazes often with ash. And um, he's quite up for just really experimenting and allowing it to possibly come out of the kiln looking quite different than he imagined. Um, he was saying when, when people get there, he'd be very happy to demonstrate as well. So there'll be plenty of scope for seeing him firing, and um, sorry, seeing him throwing pots, etc. And he's really a, a fascinating person to speak to. Lots of green men hiding around there as well, which is always a good thing. Um, right, what's the next one, please, Amy? Ah, Judy Irving. So for those of you who might have visited us last, the last two years, Judy and Ray are new to the trail. So Judy lives in Anthorne as well, just along from um, Hillary's Chapel. And she makes um, baskets in a traditional sort of way. Uh, so she grows she grows the, the willow locally and she's got facilities for soaking it and everything. She runs little courses and the baskets are just a thing of beauty to everything about them. You know, they just um, sit right in your hands. They're, they're really things of beauty, always functional. Um, and she's wonderful. You know, she can talk you through the whole process of how she approaches this and would be more than happy to, you know, show you what she does and explain about how to learn as well. Um, so great to have her on board. And what's our what's our next one, please, Amy? Ah, Hilary. So this is um, Hilary Burt, whose chapel we looked at earlier. So she, um, I don't know how she gets anything done. I think I would be tempted to just sit at the door and look at the tide. But uh, yeah, she's got this lovely, lovely space in the chapel, which, um, well, she, she does a mixture of 2D and 3D work. So quite often uh, painting, um, I think most recently drawing in pastels and quite a bit of three-dimensional kind of, I think you would say ceramic sculpture. Uh, I think she quite often uses porcelain as well. So go and see her, she'll, she'll talk you around. So could we have the next one, please, Amy? Ah, there we go, our last slide. So come and see us, basically. I, I think all of us would love to discuss each person. I've, I've not really done justice to you. Each person has an intricate and fascinating process. So, you know, do come and see us. This is very much about the place and about having the opportunity to come to the studio and really talk about the ideas in a way that you couldn't in a gallery. Um, so, you know, everyone will be selling work, but they will also be very welcome very you know welcoming and amenable to putting on the kettle and having a good old chat so hopefully we'll see you please spread the word for us thank you al that's delicious really delicious lots of waving <laughs> and clapping and thumbs up brilliant thank you to everyone for all the links in the chat this is a chat definitely worth saving remember three little buttons you can save the chat there um the recorded part of this meeting will be published later next week Big, big thanks to Amy, Joanna, to Catherine and to Al for presentations today.